Well, hello, you guys. It's good to have you here tonight. It's a blessing to gather together and to worship the Lord and study His Word. I thought before uh, we get into worship, I'd read off the announcements real quick. And uh, Life Chain on uh, Sunday, uh, we're all glad to be out there and uh, kind of making our community aware of that. And just being there, I think, is, uh, makes it successful. But uh, coming up pretty soon, uh, let's see, tomorrow night is the uh, women's study at uh, Gracious House, and that starts at 6.30. And so the ladies are all invited to that. And then we've got the Single Women's Fellowship coming up on October 16th, and that's at 4 o'clock here at church, and there's a sign-up on the counter for that. And then there's the Men's FMO Breakfast on the 23rd uh, from 8.30 to 10.30. woo -hoo! And uh, all you guys, uh, <laughs> all three of you, <laughs> bring it, bring it, bring it, come on. And, uh, and then uh, we got the men's study next Tuesday. Uh, we, we put that off for a week because I was traveling uh, this last week. And then besides the women's study, the women are going to have a conference coming up on November 13th, which is a Saturday. And uh, we're going to invite some other churches to come into that and stuff, but it'll be like an all-day event. Uh, starts at, uh, we'll kick off with the breakfast at 8.30, and then uh, uh, the studies at 9, and, and then go through the rest of the day. And so uh, we'll have a sign-up out for that here pretty quick, and the cost on that will be $10, and, uh, but there'll be some uh, gifts and stuff, and it'll be worth it. So anyway, encourage the ladies to partake of that. But with that, Father God, we ask that you would guide us tonight. Uh, help us, Lord, uh, to worship you. Help us to sing your praises and to draw close to you. And so... Have your way in our midst, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, if you're able, would you stand with me uh, while we sing our praises to the Lord? I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship you, O oh, my soul. Rejoice, take joy, my King, in what you hear. May it be a sweet, sweet sound in your ear. I love you, Lord, and I live my voice to worship you, O oh, my soul, rejoice, take joy, my King, in what you hear, let it be a sweet, sweet sound in your ear. Father, I adore you. Lay my life before you. How I love you. Jesus, I adore you. I lay my life before you. How I love you. Spirit, I adore you. I lay my life before you. How I love you, Father, I adore you. I lay my life before you. How I love you, Jesus, I adore you. Lay my life before you, how I love you, Spirit, I adore you, I lay my life before you, how I love you. 
Lord Jesus, we want to please you tonight. We sing these praises to you, Lord, from our hearts, and pray that you would guide our hearts and our minds to worship you truly in spirit and truth, and you'd be glorified in this place. In Jesus' name. One thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty, the beauty of the Lord, to inquire in his temple, the temple of the Lord, to behold the beauty, the beauty of the Lord, to inquire in his temple, the temple of the Lord. One thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord. All the days of my life to behold the beauty, the beauty of the Lord, to inquire in his temple, the temple of the Lord, to behold the beauty, the beauty of the Lord, to inquire in his temple the temple of the Lord. <clears throat> I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back, the world behind me, the cross before me, the world behind me, the cross before me, the world behind me, the cross before me, no turning back, no turning back. Though none go with me, still I will follow. Though none go with me, still I will follow. Though none go with me, still I will follow. No turning back, no turning back. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. Thank you, Father God, that we could be here tonight. Lord, to worship you and to commune with you, to study your word and to seek your face. And we ask, Lord, that you would guide us. Help us, Lord, to hear your voice tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, welcome in Jesus' name. Why don't you turn and say hello to somebody. Hello. Hello, all you somebodies. Well, tonight we're going to be in 1 Peter chapter 3. I will read the chapter together. We're only going to get to the first seven verses, but uh, we'll, we'll uh, hit on it pretty good. But uh, 1 Peter chapter 3. And so I uh, want you to get your Bibles out and open. I want you, if you would, stand up with me uh, in reverence for God's word as we read it together. 
1 Peter chapter 3, uh, beginning now at verse 1, it says, Wives likewise be submissive to your own husbands, that even if uh, they do not obey the word, they without a word may be won by the conduct of their wives, uh, when they observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear. Do not let your adornment be merely outward, uh, arranging the hair, wearing gold, or putting on fine apparel. Rather, let it be the hidden person of the heart, with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. For in this manner, in former times, the holy women who trusted in God also adorned themselves, being submissive to their own husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters you are, if you do good and not afraid of any terror. Husbands, likewise dwell with them with understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers may not be hindered. Finally, all of you be of one mind, having compassion for one another, loving as brothers, being tender-hearted, being courteous, not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing, uh, knowing that you were called to this, that you may inherit a blessing. For he who would love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. And who is he who will harm you if you become followers of what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you are blessed. And do not be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and always be ready to give an answer to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you, with meekness and fear, having a good conscience, that when they defame you uh, as evildoers, uh, those who revel your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. For it is better if the will of God, uh, if it is the will of God to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit, by whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison, who formerly were disobedient, when once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight souls, were saved through water. Uh, there is also an antitype, uh, which now saves us, uh, baptism, not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience towards God, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has, given, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers having been made subject to him. Gracious Father, we thank you for your word, and we ask that tonight, Lord, you would give us understanding in it and help us to comprehend you correctly. Help us, Lord, to know what to do and, and how to live our lives. Give us clear direction, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And amen. You guys can be seated. <clears throat> As we study through God's word, just in general, you know, it, it can't be relegated to a, a purely academic pursuit. Some people approach the Bible that way. They, they study it in a way, and they, they go through the Greek and the Hebrew, and they, they try to understand the verb tenses and all the different things, <clears throat> and it becomes an academic thing where, in a sense, you almost lose sight of God. Others study it in, in a way, but don't necessarily uh, apply it to our lives. And, and what I'm getting at is it can't just be a, a, a spiritual pursuit. There has to be the practical application wherein it actually, it actually, we live it out. It, it impacts our lives. It makes us different that we allow it to have the impact it's intended to have in our lives. And so it can't be purely academic. It can't be purely spiritual where it's just a theoretical, philosophical way of doing things. There has to be that place where the rubber hits the road and it becomes practical that we become doers of the word and not hearers only. And we find that the Bible never just lays out a principle uh, and then lets it go at that. But it, it, it seems like every time, uh, in this case, Peter, but Paul or whoever is writing, they lay out some principle. Then they give us an example to follow. They give us a way you know, to, to apply the things that we're learning in our lives. And tonight's study is very much like that. Uh, the previous chapter spoke of one of the most common relationships uh, in the Roman Empire in the world at that time. And that was the relationship between a slave and his master. Peter described, you know, obeying the laws, being a good servant, 
you know, trying to win your master over by your good work performance, you know, as a good witness, you know, as an ambassador for Christ. And he begins this chapter examining one of the most important human relationships that any, any of us will ever engage in, and that is the marriage relationship. And he starts off dealing with what I would say is a difficult marriage relationship where the wife is saved, but apparently the husband is not. And, and Paul talked about this in his letter to the Corinthians, talking about women that were married to non-believers and how to kind of how to deal with some of that stuff. But this was something that was probably fairly common, you know, in, in those days where the wife comes to a saving knowledge. You know, the, the couple's already married. Uh, one half of that marriage, in this case, the wife comes to a saving knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, but the husband is caught up in the pagan culture of the day and isn't really uh, doesn't necessarily follow her into faith. And as we get into this passage, uh, it's assumed that she came to faith after they were married because Paul also addresses previously uh, about not being unequal yoked with non-believers. And so we'll assume that didn't happen. And like I said, it seems like the, she's, she's now she's a believer and she's married to a non-believer, uh, the person being described here. And I've seen that, uh, we've seen this in ministry where women intentionally go that route thinking that they'll come to the, the, their, their prospective husband will come to the Lord, you know, after they're married, uh, which honestly seldomly really works. You know, if you can't lead them to the Lord uh, before you're married, then going against God's word isn't going to make that any easier. And so we've seen that played out too many times. But there are those times when both people in a marriage start out as non-believers, then one of them gets saved. And I kind of assume that this is where Peter is coming from. Uh, in the first couple of verses, he says, Wives, likewise be submissive to your own husbands, that even if uh, some do not obey the word, they without a word may be won by the conduct of their wives, when they observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear. And so wives likewise, or you know, in a similar fashion. And Peter is addressing the issue of submission in general, uh, as to the, you know, in the previous chapter, uh, submission in general as to the governmental leaders that are set over us, you know, our masters or our bosses, if you will, in modern times. Um, our Lord Jesus being the example that was set for us in that he yielded uh, without reviling, but committed himself to the righteous judge. He now addresses wives and perhaps women in general uh, in the next few verses. And he says, you know, wives likewise be submissive. Now, the word submissive there in the Greek word language is hupotasso. And it means to place under in an orderly fashion. And so it's not simply like, you know, women submit. Okay, he's, he's defining order within the relationship. This speaks of order as opposed to value. You know, because again, the word means to place under in an orderly fashion. And our God is the God of order. He's not the author of confusion. <clears throat> to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 14, verse 33, he said, For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. And then in verse 40, he says, Let all things be done decently and in order. And so our God simply sets things in order. And whether it's the universe uh, in the heavens above or how a family is to operate, he simply sets things in order. It, there, it's, a, it's not a value hierarchy. It's a functional hierarchy. And so he lays this out. Um, in verse 7, and, and just to kind of emphasize the point, because some people get kind of wound up about some of these verses, uh, especially if you're of a, a, a feminist bent or, uh, you know, sometimes more liberal in your theology and that kind of thing. People get kind of upset about this stuff. And they really shouldn't because, you know, again, uh, if you fast forward a little bit to verse 7, uh, here Peter says, uh, that they are, as it says here, heirs together of the grace of life. And so you see that equality, that they're both, you know, co-heirs, if you will. Uh, going back to Genesis chapter 2, verse 22, uh, God had created man. After that, uh, he created woman, but how did he do that? He took a rib out of Adam's side, you know, put him to sleep, took a rib out of his side, and he formed the woman, you know, from the rib and then presented her to Adam. But, you know, uh, like it says, you know, out of her side, not off the top of his head, uh, not off, out of his, you know, feet, but a, a co-equal, so to speak. Um, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 28, 
uh, then God blessed them, the both of them. God said to them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over it. So they gave them both dominion, if you will, over the earth. Uh, fast forward to the New Testament where Paul relates in Galatians chapter 3, verse 28, that there's neither Jew or Greek, bond or free, male or female. We are all one in Christ Jesus. And so it's not a value hierarchy. It's simply a functional hierarchy. Um, there has to be order within the household, within the family. Uh, as, a, as a police officer and as a sergeant, I would go to situations all the time where the first guy on scene was, uh, he was in charge. It was his call. Uh, but then uh, as more people would show up, perhaps a sergeant or a ranking officer would show up. And they weren't in charge until they said, okay, I'm taking over. But then when they took over, nobody would go, oh, no, you can't do that. You know, well, no, it's a sergeant. That's the rank. That's how you kind of, you know, deal with stuff. And, uh, but every now and then you'd have two or three sergeants show up. And uh, sometimes all three of them would try to be in charge at one time. And they would call that a name. <laughs> but what do, you, what do you call something with three heads? A uh, monster. <laughs> it just doesn't work. And so, again, we're talking about the, the functionality of things. Uh, later when Paul, and, and just before Paul begins his treatise on marriage there in Ephesians chapter 5, when he gets to verse 21, he's talking about Christianity in general still. And in Ephesians 5, 21, he, he encourages submitting to one another in the fear of God. And so there are those times when we submit one to another. Uh, we, you know, step back a little bit, let somebody else in a certain sense take the lead because they've got the, the expertise, the knowledge or whatever. And, um, and so we submit one to another. It's just playing those roles. And this passage, this, even this verse speaks of a submissive attitude in general. And I would say both men and women are ready to submit to God primarily, but also ready to submit generally as needed. Now, he goes on in Ephesians, and uh, in Ephesians 5, 22, Paul does anyway, and he says, wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. He says the same thing to the Colossians in Colossians 3, 18. Wives, submit to your own husbands as is fitting in the Lord. And it's interesting to me that as he writes these, gen these epistles to these different bodies of believers, he gives them instruction on what, on what a godly marriage would look like. Now, he gives them this instruction because the world doesn't know what a godly marriage looks like. You know, the, the world at that time uh, was polytheistic. Uh, they were polygamous in their marriages, and they had concubines, and they had all just kind of disarray in that relationship. But at the beginning, when God instructed man, this, this woman will be bone of your bones and flesh of your flesh, you know, and, and a man is to leave his father and mother and to be joined to his wife, and the two shall be one flesh. That was God's instruction. But because people had ignored God's word, the, the subject got very confused. And there's a lot of confusion in our culture today, not just about marriage, but about some of the most even simpler things than marriage because people are ignoring God's word. And so Paul would consistently give instruction to the people that he was writing to because they're learning a whole new way of life. And, you know, if, if, you're, if you, you know, I got saved when I was 27, and so I'd grown up uh, and become a young man, <clears throat> and I learned how to do life, I thought, you know, and I lived my life, you know, according to my own wisdom, which is pretty pathetic. And, uh, but I, when I came to know Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, I realized, you know what, I can't keep doing it my way. I, I can't sing the old Frank Sinatra song, you know, I did it my way. And he's dead. But anyway, uh, <laughs> you know, the bottom line is, is that my way was a train wreck. And so I need to learn how to do life differently. And one of the biggest parts of my life, as it is now, then as it is now, is my marriage. You know, I, I can't say I'm going to do my whole life differently except for my marriage. Or I can't do my whole life differently except for my relationship with my kids or, or other, other facets of life. It's a package deal. And so Paul's laying this out in, uh, in, in, in Paul's letters. And Peter is actually saying pretty much the same thing, uh, which is kind of cool, the consistency of that. But... Um, in each of these instances, the Holy Spirit is speaking about order in the family and likewise addresses husbands and, and wives and children, simply setting things in order, just like he did with the stars. I mean, <clears throat> when you look up at the stars at night, you know, Psalm 19 tells us that the heavens declare the glory of God, the firmament shows forth his handiwork, and, you know, day and day at our speech. And as you look at the, sky, the stars at night, if you get into astronomy and you realize that all that's moving around, 
It's like, how do you direct that traffic? Well, God put it in order, you know, and so it works and functions the way God wants it to, and that's why we have day and night and summer and winter and fall and spring, all those things. I didn't put those in the right order, but anyway, God will put it in the right order. And, uh, and, and so God orders everything that, that, that we're about. Why wouldn't he order one of the most important relationships in our lives and a relationship that it's intended to reflect his relationship with the church, you know, with the, with the bride of Christ, if you will. And so, again, he sets things in order. Um, and, and simply just that, but, you know, the only thing is that the stars, they've been set in order, but they don't give God grief over it. <laughs> Man is the only one that gives God grief about the order of things. You go, no, I want to do it different. But the nature doesn't do that. It, it responds to what God sets in order. Now, he gives the admonition, then he gives the rationale. And one of the rationales or the reasons behind the admonition, it, it's our witness. That as an example, as an example, you know, a non-believing husband might be won over by the submissive conduct of their wives. Now, to a lot of women, you know, coming from a, not that I can totally come from a woman's perspective, but I've heard a lot of women out on this issue. And some women think, no, he's like really bad. You know, he doesn't care. He'll just use me. He'll just abuse me. He'll just whatever. And, and, and there's an aspect of this that in, in, from a common sense standpoint, go, it doesn't make sense. I mean, if I just let him walk on me, if I just let him, you know, dictate or whatever, uh, that'll win in Christ. And I say, yeah. And I don't say, yeah, because I know better. I say, yeah, because that's what God's word says. And, and there's aspects of this, again, in a, in a practical realm, don't seem to make sense. But there's a spiritual reality that when we yield to what God wants to do, there's that element of the God factor, how God will intervene in the midst of a relationship in a way that nobody ever saw that God would do that. He comes from left field or far right field or somewhere in, in a way that we didn't expect. And it's amazing how it works when we yield it to what God wants to do. But he says here uh, that when they observe their chaste conduct accompanied by fear. Now, their chaste behavior or conduct is not just in a virginal sense, but free from defilements. Uh, the word means to be free from defilements, to be holy, to be innocent, to be pure. And it's when a, when a person, I, I would say a woman, but I think any person, man or a woman, when, they're, when their conduct is impeccable, when they're trying very hard to be reverent and respectful, uh, you know, to be pure, if you will, and innocent of evil, to walk in holiness, to walk in the spirit, that has an impact on everybody around you anyway, including a husband, including a wife, maybe a non-believing wife. And when it says in fear, it's in the sense of reverence or respect and honor. Now, we got the situation in front of us where Peter is, is talking to or about <clears throat> a woman and her apparently non-believing husband. Oftentimes what you see happen, and we see this in life and we see it in the Bible, oftentimes when a man gets saved, his wife and kids will soon follow suit. We see this with Cornelius in Acts chapter 10. Uh, in Acts chapter 16, we've got the Philippian jailer. He gets saved, and you read in that same account, and then his wife and his whole household got saved. And so that's pretty common. When a, when a man gets saved, oftentimes, you know, the leader of the home, if you will, the rest of the family more or less follows. But <clears throat> when the wife gets saved first, it seems like at times it's a little more problematic. There's something in men uh, that resist following their wives in a spiritual sense. Something about finding it out for themselves, it's a pride thing. I'm not sure exactly how to put my finger on it. All I know is that to some degree I experienced it. My wife, uh, you know, I got saved. Uh, my wife prayed this, the prayer at the same time I did. Uh, but sometime after that, all of a sudden, she starts listening to Christian radio. She starts reading her Bible. And she wants to listen to Christian music. And she's kind of driving me nuts. You know, and it's like, hey, you know, I want to listen to oldies, you know, and, and all that kind of stuff. And I was, there was still that, that fleshly, secular aspect of my life where she's growing spiritually. And I'll be honest with you, when I, when I kind of recognized it for what it was, I felt threatened. How can I, you know, my wife's smart. How can I, you know, compete with that, so to speak? You know, how can I catch up? You know, what do I got to do? And because uh, I wasn't really all that interested, honestly, at that time in spiritual things. I was glad to be saved, but that was about as deep as I wanted to go. And then um, 
uh, she, she messed me up. <laughs> she started praying for me. And then she got our homeschool group, our homeschool, our home fellowship group uh, to start praying for me. And I didn't realize all these people were praying for me, but all of a sudden one day I had this bright idea, hey, go buy a new Bible. <laughs> you know, when I had this revelation in my own heart that I needed to get into God's word. And I thought it was my idea. But anyway, <laughs> because it was my idea, I could do it. If somebody else had told me to do it, I wouldn't have done it. But that's just how we are, isn't it? Anyway, um, Peter is saying essentially that you don't have to preach at them. You don't have to put tracks in their lunch pail, uh, all that kind of stuff. Uh, he's saying that you'll win them over by simply submitting to them. And again, this seems like a, an impractical, improbable kind of a thing, but you, you can't ever discount the impact of the Holy Spirit and, and, and an obedient heart doing what God's word says to do and then sit back and watch what happens. And that's just it. It's a miraculous thing that God does and works in the hearts of men. And so... <clears throat> In other words, that the husbands might see in their wives the grace and the love of Jesus and that they might be touched and won by that love. You know, it's the goodness of God that draws us to repentance. And so you see that played out. And like we've, we've said in other scenarios, that woman that's being described here may be the only Bible that man will ever see or read. You know, he, may be, he won't pick up a, a Bible. He won't just come into church. But he'll, he'll watch the Bible lived out in the form of his spouse. And so we might just be that living epistle that Paul describes in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 2 and 3, where it says, You are our epistle written in our hearts, written, uh, known and read by all men, for as much as you are an epistle of Christ ministered by us, written not with ink, but by the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of flesh, that is, of the heart. And so, you know, I want to be that a living epistle. I want to be that, that faithful ambassador of Christ. And whether it's to my wife or to you guys or to anybody that I meet or uh, people that are watching me that are, don't even know are watching me. And so we, we want to walk, uh, you know, in holiness and walk in the ways of the Lord and trust that God will use that to do that work. In verse 3, he says, do not let your adornment be merely outward, arranging the hair, wearing gold, and putting on fine apparel. You know, elaborating somewhat, don't let your beauty just be outwardly. You know, true beauty is not in the physical outward beauty, but it's, the, the as it says here, um, uh, I lost the hidden person of the heart uh, in verse 4. But, uh, you know, some women... Uh, and I'm not gonna. I'm gonna be careful where I go here, uh, but uh, some women spend a lot of time working on the outside appearance, and, and not nearly enough on the inside. You know, I used to tease uh, one of my daughters. I won't tell you which one because you'll figure it out. But anyway, I used to tease one of my daughters. You know that if you spend as much time reading your Bible as you do, you know, putting your makeup on, uh, we'd have another theologian in the house. You know. <laughs> <laughs> But it's true. I mean, there are things like that where people do worry so much about the outward appearance, uh, but they don't pay nearly enough attention to what, in a sense, is on the inside. And for some women, it would be a game changer if they read their Bibles as much as they spend time working on their nails and their hair and makeup and stuff. But, you know, generally speaking, by the way, that won't work for guys because if a guy spent as much time reading the Bible as you did getting ready to go to work or anywhere else, you know... Uh, Three seconds, rub the towel on your head, brush your teeth, you're out the door. <laughs> okay, I read the Bible for you. We read four verses today. That was twice as much as I got ready for work. But, um, but Paul addresses women uh, uh, and their appearance as well. Uh, we read in 1 Timothy chapter 2, uh, verses 9 and 10, it says, In like manner also, let the women adorn themselves in modest apparel, uh, with propriety and moderation, uh, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly clothing, but which is proper for women professing godliness with good works. You know, one of the things I like about this, besides the whole modesty thing, and I've been very blessed. My wife and all my daughters have been very modest, you know, and I've even had times where my, uh, my wife or my daughters have approached me and they're wearing something. Hey, do you, is this okay to wear to church or is this okay to wear to such and such? You know, and they let me kind of 
you know, they, they allow me in a sense to be the, the gauge on that. And I'm pretty conservative. I don't get up the measuring tape and all that stuff, but I'm pretty conservative. And, uh, and over the years, all my daughters have been very, you know, yielded to that. And it's been a real blessing to me because I, I've told them, I don't want to have to avert my eyes when I look at you. I don't want to blush when I see you. You know, I don't want to feel uncomfortable. And if I do, then somebody else will also. And so that's been kind of the, the standard for a long time. But notice that in this reference from Paul, uh, when he says, you know, um, uh, in like manner also, let the women adorn themselves in modest apparel with propriety and moderation, uh, not with braided hair or gold or uh, pearls or costly clothing, but verse 10 gets me, but with but which is proper for women professing godliness and good works. So what I'm getting at is there is a standard there somewhere. What is proper for women that are professing godliness? You know, it's not really just a, a free-for-all, uh, you know, take your liberty, whatever. You know, and I, I know this is a learning curve, too. You know, when people get saved, they're, they're coming out of a lifestyle, who knows what. And so there is that time of, uh, you know, kind of figuring it out. But... Some try to use this passage actually to keep women from wearing makeup and so on. And, uh, and I think they're totally missing the point. Uh, true beauty isn't in the outward appearance, but true beauty is the beauty of the heart and the character of the individual. Uh, but I do side with J. Vernon McGee. You know, if the barn needs painting, paint it. You know, <laughs> so anyway, just don't lose your focus. But uh, so yeah, notice I did that. So if you're going to get mad, get mad at J. Vernon. <laughs> Verse 4, rather, let it be the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. And so while Peter mentions the outer appearance in the previous verse, here he focuses more on the inward heart of the woman. And uh, he focuses on, as he describes here, that which is incorruptible. And, uh, and you think about that for a minute. You know, we're all subject uh, to the ravages of time. Yeah, well, most of us. My wife doesn't seem to be. But uh, yeah, that's right. But, uh, but the average man or woman usually doesn't look, a good, doesn't look as good at 72 as they did at 20. You ever seen those pictures? You see some old guy that you know that you know, you're friends with. Then not, you, you go into the house, you walk down the hall, and you see a picture of him when they were like 19 or 20. You go, Who, who's that? <laughs> well, that's me. No way. <laughs> Life's been hard, huh? You know? <laughs> but, but that's just it. You know, uh, the outward beauty and stuff fades over time. And, uh, you know, at least in a, in a, in a, in a physical sense that way. And uh, it's, it's corruptible. This world is a corrupting influence on us, you know, and but what is on the inside is everlasting. It's eternal. And I think it gets better with age or time with the Lord. You know, Samuel tells us in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7, he says, For the Lord does not look or does not see as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. You know, and that's, you know, I, I stretch this to a limit sometimes. That's why, you know, I don't wear like fancy clothes preaching. That's why, I, you know, I'm just pretty casual. You know, and uh, because it's not about the outward appearance. I mean, we want to be decent and all that kind of stuff and modest, but it's not about the kind of clothes we wear. You know, and it's not about, you know, in a sense, even how we look on the outside, apart from maybe just having a joyful smile. You know, uh, that's a big thing right there. But the beauty of a gentle spirit, uh, something, as it says here, that the Lord appreciates. You know, a quiet spirit isn't uh, describing a muzzled or restrained spirit as much as it's describing a spirit that's at peace. I love that. You know, when it says a, a quiet spirit, um, the word quiet there uh, speaks, no pun intended, of tranquility, of being undisturbed, uh, and at rest, you know, unmoved uh, by the outward things or circumstances. There are times, I'm sure we've all been in the same place, I've been there, I, I can think of many times when I've been there, where Literally, things are swirling around us. I, I've been in a situation where uh, officers were shot, uh, bullets are flying everywhere, it's pandemonium in a certain sense, and God kept me in perfect peace. And I'm on the radio directing units to go places and do things, and later on, people are coming up to me for hours afterwards, kind of go, Sarge, why did you sound so calm on the radio? 
Why, why are you even okay now? And I said, well, I've got the peace of the Lord in my heart. I've got Jesus in my heart. I know where I'm going. And, and we can have that peace. And that's the kind of peace that's being discussed here. It, it, it's that, that, that quiet spirit. And again, it's not being muzzled or restrained, but it's the quietness is the quietness of soul, the quietness of spirit. And that's, that's huge. I've met women, you know, that uh, godly women in, in the various places where I've been, and they exude that peace and that quiet. I mean, they could be laughing and having a good time and, and, and be pensive, you know, a moment later or whatever, but there's something about them. You see that they are really are at peace, and, and that's what the Lord's looking for, and that's pleasing to him because what are they? They're, they're trusting the Lord completely. Whatever happens on the outside, the external things, the stuff, politics or, you know, whatever's going on in the world, um, in a sense, yeah, we acknowledge that, but, you know, it's still at peace because we're at peace with our maker, and we know where we're going when the whole thing ends. And so Paul describes that peace in Philippians chapter 4, verse 7, when he says, The peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. Jesus tells us, I give you a peace, not like the world gives you peace, but I give you like real peace. You know, and it's that it's not the fake peace that you know could fall apart at any moment. It's not that false peace that you're trusting in it and it's not really there. But it's, the, it's that peace that surpasses all understanding that can only come from the Prince of Peace. And so that's what he wants us to have. And I don't think just women either, but men need to have that same peace as well. A woman that truly trusts in her God, not that there aren't those more chaotic moments and, and thoughts and situations, but overall is characterized by that quietness of soul because she's trusting in the Lord. That will have an impact on an unbelieving husband and perhaps unbelieving co-workers or whoever. Uh, in verses uh, 5 and 6, it says, For in this manner, uh, in former times, the holy women who trusted in God, who adorned themselves being submissive to their own husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters you are if you do good and are not afraid with any terror. And so Peter begins to give us some examples here. Uh, women who've trusted in God, uh, which is described as an adornment. I like that. I mean, some people go, you know, like Mr. T went a little too far. You know, if you guys remember Mr. T, like 8,000 gold necklaces and all that kind of stuff. I think a simple gold chain you know, <laughs> would have been enough. But anyway, he took it over the top. But, but the idea is that when we, when we walk in faith that way, when a woman walks in faith that way, it's an adornment to her. And an adornment, I think of a, a fine piece of jewelry. Or, or something, you know, that's pretty, not, you know, over the top, but or something that just looks nice. And it's a, a decoration of sorts. And, and that's how God sees it, you know, um, <clears throat> because it's pleasing to the Lord. And um, that quietness, that, that peace, like wisdom and mercy and truth, which are beautiful. I mean, the, the writer of Proverbs tells us in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 3, says, Let not mercy and truth forsake you. Bind them around your neck. You know, wear it like an adornment, if you will. Now, I saw something here, and I hope you see it too. But in, in, in verse 5, it's, I'm sorry, in verse 6, it says, As Sarah obeyed Abraham, I mean, and calling him Lord, whose daughter you are. But as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. She was submissive, as Peter is describing. But just notice for a second that it doesn't say Sarai and Abram. Remember, they started out as, Abram and Sarai. That's, that's when they got married. That's when they lived, you know, for many, many years. But then at one point, through several things, Abram went from being Abram to being Abraham. And I believe it's when he acknowledged God for who he is and had his own born-again experience. And God changed his name. He said, no longer Abram, you're going to be Abraham. And then he changed Sarai's name to Sarah. Now, what's the difference? With Abraham, it's Abraham, okay? The, 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 the H-A, the, the, the Ruach of God, the breath of God, or the spirit of God in Abraham's life. He became born again. Sarah, the same thing. She went from being Sarai to Sarah, okay? The breath of God, the Ruach of God, the Holy Spirit living in her, and a new name to kind of affirm that, if you will. What I'm getting at, he didn't say 
you know, Sarai submitted to God and called him Lord. Sarah, walking in the spirit, was able to do that. Abraham, walking in the spirit, lived his life in such a way that she was able to submit to him. But what I'm getting at is that they were doing it in the spirit. You know, uh, without the spirit of God working at a minimum, for example, in at least Sarah's heart or the woman's heart, she might submit. I've seen women that were non-believers that were submitted to their husbands. But you ever submit to somebody with clenched teeth? Ah, I'm doing it. <laughs> you know? You ever, you ever submitted to somebody but had that resentment in your heart? You know, and it's kind of eating away at you? You were, you were submitting. And, I, and as I see Sarah and Abraham living in this, this relationship, and she's able to submit to him, I would put forth to you this because he's walking in the spirit, she's walking in the spirit, and it just works. It clicks. It, it, it makes sense. But if they were not walking in the spirit, you're either walking in the spirit or what? You're walking in the flesh. And if you're walking in the flesh, then the works of the flesh will manifest themselves sooner or later, whether you're submitted or not. But, you know, I'm just going to cherry pick a couple of uh, descriptions from this list in Galatians chapter 5, verse 19. This, this list actually uh, lists the, the works of the flesh, but I'll just pick out a few. Hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, murder, <laughs> you know, uh, yeah, anybody heard of a, a woman that was, you know, being told to submit to her husband, but this is what came of it, <laughs> you know? Um, you know, in the flesh, that's what we do. And obviously, some husbands make this easier or harder at times. Uh, but please notice that it was, again, both Sarah filled with the Spirit and Abraham walking in the Spirit that seemed to make it work. And then as you read through their lives, you see the fruit of the Spirit in their lives. In Galatians 5, and 23, it says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. W wouldn't you like that to describe your marriage? I do. I want that to describe my marriage. And there is something amazing about how our relationship affects our entire being. You know, um, including our countenance. You know, again, the inward beauty shows in an outward beauty as well. There's something about having that relationship with Jesus that just becomes apparent in the life of a believer, a life that is lived in purity and holiness. Uh, it leaves marks of beauty on a person's countenance. You, can, you walk up to people sometimes and you go, you're a believer, aren't you? You can tell by, by just, you, you see them in the market and you see just that, the, the, the tranquil, serene kind of a countenance or the joy or whatever. And, uh, and you can say, hey, that person's a believer. Uh, sometimes you see other people. Uh, and sadly, the same is true of a person who's lived a life of rebellion to God, you know, lived a hard life of sex, drugs, and rock and roll. And those years can be very cruel uh, and on full display in a person's countenance as well. You know, I've, uh, I'm going to be careful in this example I'm about to use, but um, I've got a younger brother, uh, and I, I love him. Uh, I think he loves me, but I, anyway, uh, he's, been a, he's a total non-believer, has been his whole life. I've shared the gospel with him many times and all that kind of stuff. But as we've been standing together, I've had people walk up to me, and one person, one kid walked, oh, is that your dad? To my brother. <laughs> because I look, and I'm older than him, and, and enough, and uh, but he looks like he's 10, 15 years older than me. He's had a hard life. And sometimes people wear their lives, you know, on their countenance, and you can kind of tell. And I know, I know people have had a hard life and gotten saved, and it's awesome. But sometimes you still carry some of those scars and those things with you. Um, but what I'm kind of getting at is that, um, you know, um, that countenance that he's talking about, that the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, sometimes it manifests itself in a physical way as well, you know, in, in people's lives. And Sarah did call Abraham Lord, but if you remember, there was also a time when uh, she became upset with Abraham over Hagar. 
Remember at one point, uh, Hagar got upset. Actually, uh, uh, Sarah got upset at Hagar and Ishmael and told Abraham, hey, get rid of that bondwoman and her son. You know, and she was, I guess, not too nice about it. And Abraham's trying to figure out what to do when God spoke to him and said, listen to your wife. You know, so what I'm kind of getting at is that it's not just a strictly one-way kind of a street. Uh, there is that give and take. But speaking to women still, um, the last part of the verse there, it says, um, whose daughters, you know, as Sarah called Abraham, uh, calling him Lord, whose daughters you are, if you do good and, and not are not afraid with any terror. I had to make it a point speaking to women because people now think that, you know, whose daughters you are, that could apply to some guys. But anyway, it doesn't. But, um, but he says, whose, da whose daughters you are, if you do good and are not afraid with any terror. So if you do good and if you're not afraid, well, that's kind of like the opposite of faith most of the time. And so you tr you're trusting on God is what I'm getting at. And so Peter uses Sarah as an example um, in this. And Jesus, uh, just to bring this into it, uh, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 11, verse 19, he said, the son of man came eating and drinking. And, and they said, look, a glutton and a wine bibber, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Then Jesus replied, but wisdom is justified by her children. And, uh, and, and so what he's really saying is, look at the final results, the fruit of his ministry, which was salvation for so many. But he did things that did not make sense to a lot of people. In fact, outright offended some. But he says, wisdom is, you know, look at the children. Wisdom is justified by her children. And so, pretty cool. Now, Peter uses Sarah as an example, but he never mentions her physical beauty. If you, if you look back, you know, uh, into Genesis chapter 18 and thereabouts, Sarah is described basically as drop-dead gorgeous. Earlier in, in their marriage, as they traveled about, he was concerned about people trying to steal her away. Uh, later, when she's 80 years old, she's still being sought after by kings and powerful men. Uh, and so she was just, a, you know, a, a beautiful woman into her uh, old age. Uh, but Peter only talks about the inward beauty. Doesn't even mention her quote unquote stunning uh, physical appearance, uh, which was exceeded by her, her beauty of the heart. And so women are daughters of Sarah in faith as they walk and live in the same faith uh, with a submissive spirit leading to obedience. And what I get out of that is by doing good and not being afraid walking in faith. And it sounds an awful lot like Micah chapter 6, verse 8. He has shown you, O man, or in this case, maybe O woman, uh, what is good? And what does the Lord require of you but to do justly, uh, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God? And so <clears throat> Peter obviously addressing uh, women and, and women in marriage and, and being submissive and stuff. Then he turns his attention now to the men in verse 7. And he says, husbands likewise dwell with them with understanding, uh, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel and as being heirs together of the grace of life that your prayers may not be hindered. And so he speaks seven verses on marriage, essentially. Uh, at this point, uh, six of the verses are directed to women and one verse, if you will, uh, to the man. Um, and you will, well, why is that? Some would say that it's because it's more challenging for a woman to live with a man, and she needs more instruction. <laughs> uh, but uh, if you flip over to Ephesians and, and read through that, and I go through this every time I go through premarital counseling. Uh, in, in Ephesians chapter 5, uh, there's uh, 12 verses dedicated to marriage outright, uh, 11 of which are directed to the man and one for the woman. And so uh, it's kind of a, a seesaw battle here. But... Peter does what Paul does uh, when he addresses the issue of wives submitting to their husbands. Uh, he doesn't simply just leave it there. Uh, he also addresses how husbands are to treat their wives in a sense the other shoe is about to fall. Um, I've had a number of husbands over the years uh, complain to me at times about uh, their wives not submitting to them. Uh, they're, they're quoting 
typically from uh, Ephesians chapter 5, you know, wives submit to their husbands. And, um, and they'll do that, and then um, uh, I'll typically ask them, well, do you know what the rest of that passage says? <laughs> you know, there's a few more verses there that are dedicated to the men and how they're to treat their wives. Or is there any other verse in the Bible that you can quote? Uh, you, know, <laughs> you know, to try to bring that bar down a little lower, you know. <laughs> and, uh, and it's interesting because when people come in with that mentality, that's the only verse on their brain, you know. And, uh, and it's like, and it's very self-serving uh, typically at that point. Um, as we read and study our Bibles, uh, we shouldn't always be looking how to apply it to someone else. We should be reading our Bible, looking how to apply it to ourselves, and perhaps at times there may be a, an opportunity where you can help somebody else out, but the primary application, you know, has to be us. If, if you, you know, it's kind of funny being up here watching everybody else sometimes. I'm, I'm reading a passage, I'm doing something, and you see somebody elbow somebody else, like, hey, get it, you know, hello, wake up, <laughs> take a note. <laughs> and, uh, but it says here that uh, husbands likewise dwell with them, referring to their wives, uh, with understanding. And, you know, all that tongue-in-cheek stuff, you know, who can understand a woman, all that kind of thing. Um, you know what? Uh, God holds us accountable for this. You know, you get to the last part of this verse, you know, that your prayers be not hindered. Uh, we can joke around all day long. Uh, but, men, we have a responsibility uh, to do what the Bible tells us to do here. And uh, a right. And when it says to dwell with them with understanding, there's a couple ways you can take this. The first way I take this is rightly understanding Scripture. You know, that, as it says in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, that we study to show ourselves approved unto God, a workman that needs not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, not slanting it in our favor, not, you know, leveraging it against our wives or using it as a weapon, uh, as so many have done in the past. You know, rightly dividing the word of truth. We're, we're expected uh, to know and understand God's word, but we're also expected to know and understand our wives. You know, and uh, each each woman is you know distinct in, in that sense that an individual. Uh, you can't. I've heard uh, recently a young man foolishly say, "Well, I'm pretty good with women. I understand them pretty good." And I think, oh, all all, all 155 pounds of uh, you know 22 years. Huh? Ooh, man, <laughs> you're not just dumb. You're brave. <laughs> but um. But we're told in Proverbs, in, in, in Proverbs chapter 27, verse 23, it says, Be diligent to know the state of your flocks and attend to your herds. And, um, and I, I take that as I'm called to be the, the priest of my home. I know that. But, you know, I'm called to be the shepherd of my home as well. And my first little lamb is my wife. And then my kids. And then, you know, in a functional sense, you guys kind of fall into place there that we're all sheep in the same, you know, uh, pasture and all that kind of stuff. But to be a good shepherd, you've got to watch the sheep. You've got to watch them. You've got to know what's going on. You've got to see around them, anticipate things for them that they may or may not see. Uh, when they're wounded, you've got to, you know, put, you know, oil or balm on them. Because um, if you don't, it'll fester and get worse. You know, there's different things that a shepherd does to take care of his sheep. And in this passage, I mean, it, it doesn't even mention the, the, the shepherding aspect of things apart from understanding. And so we're called to understand what's going on uh, with our wives. And um, Solomon, it, 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 Proverbs 27, verse 23 says, Be diligent to know the state of your flocks and attend to your herds. But if you read the rest of that proverb, it describes how when you take care of the sheep, they will take care of you. They will provide wool for you. They will provide milk for your family. And, and it goes down the list of things that as, as you take care of them, they will literally take care of you. It's like you're, some guys are told in the, uh, the Army or the Marine Corps boot camp, you know, you, you take care of this weapon, it'll take care of you. And it's the same kind of a concept. But if you let it go, uh, if you don't take care of it, then you could be in big trouble. And um, I mean, I, I would assert that as we take care of our and, and love our wives, we make it easier for them to be submitted to us. You know, some men make it really hard, and, and it's really a faith walk and a faith test for some women. And, and, it, and it seems disproportional, because I'm not sure if guys are just oblivious or what, but more often than not, it's the women that suffer uh, in those kinds of relationships. And um, 
And I think we can make it much easier at times for our wives. And I think that's what, what Paul was talking about in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 28, when he said, So husbands ought uh, to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. I know that as I've sought to minister to my wife and take care of her, uh, men are initiators, women are responders. And as we initiate that love, just like God initiates his love to us, then he waits for us to respond appropriately back to him. It, men, as we initiate that, that love and that kindness and all those different things to our wives, they're going to respond. And more often than not, they're going to respond in love as well. And it just becomes this kind of snowballing, feel-good, you know, uh, thing that it, it, it's pretty cool. And, uh, and I know that... Um, I know that it works because I've seen it, I've seen it in action. And and then it, the next thing he says there, husbands likewise dwell with them uh, with understanding, giving honor to the wife. And I would just declare to you, you know, you guys probably heard about that movie if you haven't seen it. You know, God is not dead. God is not dead once, not twice, but three times now. <laughs> I'm so glad he's not dead. <laughs> but I would just to say that that chivalry is not dead either, or shouldn't be. I think that young men need to be taught chivalry. They need to be taught to open a door uh, for a lady. They need to be taught to escort their wife or, or a woman, whoever they're with, their mother. I think I, I try and tell young men all the time, practice on your mom, practice on your sisters. This is how you treat a lady, you know. And uh, I was with a, a young man last week. We're having coffee together. And I watched this, this guy, middle-aged guy, get out of his truck and make, you know, beat feet for Joe's across the street. I saw his wife get out of the truck, following about 15 feet behind, trying to catch up. He walked in, uh, opened the door, let it swing shut. She opened the door, ordered coffee. And uh, it was one of those things that's like, I think I can fix this. <laughs> you know? And then they got their coffee and then left the same way. I go, that was not a gentleman. You know, and he had no clue about what chivalry is or how to treat a woman and, uh, or how to treat a lady. And, um, and I think those are kinds of things that, that we, to some it is a lost art. That's too bad. But I think Christianity, when it talks about esteeming others better than ourselves, about loving our wives the way Jesus loved us, all these different things add up to what we would perhaps call chivalry, you know, in our own culture. And so... Open the door for her. Walk her to and from uh, the door, if you will. Take care of her. You know, put on a clean shirt. Um, <laughs> be that knight. <laughs> Sorry, bro. <laughs> uh, be that knight in shining armor that, that treats her like a princess. You know, and and, and that's and and teach your sons that. You know, teach young men that uh, where you can, and acknowledge her hard work. You know, uh, her loving kindness and. and praising her, demonstrating an appreci appreciation for her positive contribution into your own life. I, I heard a pastor's wife years ago uh, talking about how, um, you know, guys, I don't know if you ever heard of the, the, the chick flick series uh, of Pride and Prejudice, and, and Darby is the, uh, the hero, you know, Darcy, yeah, that guy. Uh, <laughs> he's the hero of the film, and she was saying that Darcy is dead, he, he was always a figment of, of, of every woman's imagination. He doesn't exist. Your husband's not going to thank you for doing the laundry. And when I heard that, I go, whoa, hang on there, lady. <laughs> because I have this magical hamper. I, I, I throw my stuff in it. My drawer gets empty, but my hamper gets full. Then I come back, and magically, I open my drawer, and all my my tidy whitey tonies and my t-shirts are, are folded and neat and they're stacked there. And it's like magic. It just, it goes away, then it comes back. It's like, because my wife takes care of me. She blesses me and I thank her all the time for doing my laundry and for taking care of me. I remember, I remember when she and the kids, man, they left for a trip for like three weeks. They went down south to take care of uh, her mom and stuff. And, and I was by myself for three weeks. And I remember, I remember the feeling. Standing in front of the washing machine, <laughs> which I had not, I'd fixed it several times over the years, but I had not actually operated it in like 35 years. <laughs> and I remember standing there kind of going, hmm. <laughs> Wasn't one of those, what would Jesus do moments? What would my wife do? 
But it's, when, you re- when you come to that realization, you realize, ooh, I've been taken really good care of. <laughs> but, but showing that appreciation somehow, acknowledging those things, looking for reasons to honor her. You know, Mother's Day. You know, uh, don't have the attitude, well, she's not my mother. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you're on your own. No, 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 no. She's the mother of your children. <laughs> and so look for a, a reason to celebrate and to honor her. But then it says, as the weaker vessel. And there's different ways to look at this. Uh, and, I, and I think both are valid. Um, a couple that I'm going to present anyway, as the weaker vessel. Just to say it up front, weaker doesn't necessarily mean inferior. Okay. And there are physical differences biologically, physiologically, and all that kind of stuff, uh, and emotionally between men and women, and I praise God for that. I wouldn't want to be married to a big, hairy dude like, you know, whatever. You know? It's like, no, I'm part of the program. <laughs> I'm glad they're different. <laughs> My wife's good. <laughs> oh. But, you know, women are designed with a, speci- a specific mission and functionality in mind. Uh, essentially bearing children, nursing them, nurturing them, uh, for which w- w- we should all be very grateful. I mean, they're not limited to that, but that's the basic biological differences between men and women, uh, different functionalities. You know, men are designed to work, generally to, uh, built to lift heavier things, built to work and to hunt, to, to provide for their families and stuff. And, you know, people try to say, well, w- men and women are equal physically. No, they're not. I mean, it's, they're just not. I mean, it's not a, 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 a rip on women or anything else, but I have watched women try to do men roles. And, uh, I mean, you go back and look at the footage of 9-11 and when uh, the towers came down or sifting through all the stuff, who's lifting all the stuff? The men are, because that's what they're designed to do. You know, and, and but I praise God that we're different because, you know, I, I'll walk by my kid and he'll be doing something wrong and, uh, you know, I'll just smack her on the back of the head and say, get going, you know. And my wife's go, oh, poor baby, come here, you know. <laughs> and she'll, she'll nurture him back into whatever, but I'm like, ah, come on, get over, you know. And, uh, and, but it works together. You know, it, it works together in a, in, a, in a very good way. And so uh, different functionalities, both of which are needed for survival, easily recognizable. Uh, gender confusion is just that by confused individuals uh, who reject the truth of God's word. Uh, When you reject the truth, all that's left is lies and confusion. And you look at the people that are into the whole gender diversity stuff. uh, I'm being kind, I think, just by leaving it there with a description. But you look at the people who are involved in all that stuff, they are people who are disregarding God's word and disregarding the order that God put, you know, in our universe. And, um, but when it says weaker vessel, there's another aspect of this, and, and again, not intended to be a, a derogatory of any means, but uh, weaker could mean, in a way, uh, more vulnerable, uh, and, I would, and I would say in an emotional sense. Uh, when Paul admonishes Timothy about women not teaching or having authority over a man, which could be just another really cool study, um, one of the reasons he gives, it's interesting, more, more often than not, when God says do something or don't do something, he doesn't always give an explanation as to why. But in this particular case, when he says that women shouldn't teach or have authority over man, he gives two more reasons right behind that. Then there's a couple more you can find in Corinthians. But he says that in, in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 14, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. And there was that aspect of uh, her being vulnerable in an emotional sense and, you know, being deceived that way. Whereas Adam knew very clear-mindedly what right and wrong were, and he just choose to do, chose to do the wrong thing. And so there's those two aspects of that. But then he, he says there, being heirs together of the grace of life. And so when it says being heirs together of the grace of life, the picture I get in my mind is that we're in this together. It's not, uh, you know, a, a solo adventure, if you will. Husbands and wives move through life or intended to move through life, you know, as a team, in tandem, helping one another. Uh, the, the phrase that uh, is still hard for me to kind of wrap my mind around at times, you know, I want to say help mate, but no, it's help meet. 
you know, as you get into the, in Genesis, when uh, God brought Eve into the picture, a uh, help meet, you know, to help the man move forward, but they would do so together. And again, the functionality of that relationship. Uh, we're in this together, husbands and wives, depending on each other, uh, ministering to each other, uh, each benefiting from the grace of life, really the grace of God. Uh, and again, you know, spiritually, my wife took off first. Uh, the Holy Spirit drew her in and, and began, she began taking in God's word wherever she could. And there was a short season where my wife and I were unequally yoked. Unequally yoked doesn't just apply to believers and non-believers. Uh, I believe that unequal yoke can apply to someone who is more mature spiritually, to another person who's not as spiritually maybe developed or whatever, and there can be that that difference between the two. And um, and my wife and I certainly had that situation uh, for a season, but not not long after that. And, and again, think the fruit of the many people praying for me. Um, God got over my heart and gave me a hunger and thirst for his for righteousness and for His Word. And I began to study the Bible voraciously. Uh, I was still working uh, street dope and uh, working at night and going to court a lot. But I would get up, I'd come home from work, sleep for an hour and a half, two hours. I would get up and I'd study the Bible for three or four hours. And I would lock myself in my garage at times away from my, my younger kids who were always trying to get at me and stuff. And uh, <clears throat> my wife, in a certain sense, almost regretted what she prayed. Uh, Make my husband a more godly man and boom, he locks himself away like a hermit, you know, and studying the Bible. And she became literally a Bible widow uh, for a season in our life. And then um, the Holy Spirit spoke to me one day and said, hey, this is not a solo adventure. You're supposed to bring your wife along, you know, in this whole thing. And he gave me, he started giving me these scriptures. And one of them was in Ephesians chapter 5, uh, verses 25 and 26. It says, husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her that you might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. But I realized all of a sudden that my duty wasn't just to Jesus, quote, unquote, alone, that because of my devotion to Jesus, my, my, my responsibility was to Jesus, yes, but also to my wife and to my kids, that I was supposed to bring them along, you know, on this adventure that we call Christianity. And, um, and so God began, you know, to, to speak to my heart about how I could minister to my wife and how I could you know, minister to my kids. And, um, and, it, and as it says there in Ephesians, that he, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, but it's almost, as it says that she might be presented without spot or wrinkle, almost as if it's like my wife is my report card, you know, on what I am as a husband. You know, when I present her, if you will, to God <clears throat> without spot or wrinkle, in a certain sense, it's a representation of my own walk, of my own life, and my, my investment in her. And I've said this many times, because I can tell you for a fact, I am a better man, I am a better Christian uh, in, in so many ways because of my wife. And I can, uh, she, she strengthens me in so many ways. And my hope and my prayer is that she would be a better and a stronger woman of God because of me, not in spite of me. You know, because I don't want to be a hindrance you know, in her life in any way. And, and I, it's like, you know, run, run, run. <laughs> and, and all I got to do is stay one little gallop ahead, you know, <laughs> or, you know, an inch ahead or something. I don't know what, but, uh, but, but also our kids. And, you know, um, um, we've had seasons in our life where all of our kids were tight with the Lord and things are going really well. And, uh, and then we've had seasons too where, you know, uh, a couple have gotten off into the weeds and you kind of wonder what's going on and you, know, and you question yourself, what'd you do? You know, did I do it right? Did, what did I do wrong? And, uh, but I've talked to lots of other um, people that I respect uh, that have had the same situation. Kids are free moral agents. You know, they, they're going to do what they're going to do kind of thing. And sometimes they've got to get out in the weeds to figure out, hey, I'm in the weeds. You know, how do I get out of this mess? And they cry out to God and, and God, you know, meets them where they're at. But, we're told in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4, And you fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. And it's just a responsibility to teach our kids, you know, to, to show them what right and wrong are, to, to demonstrate that through God's word, 
and to, to, to do your best uh, to help them develop into God, the Christian men and women, you know, and, and uh, like they used to say on Monday Night Football, you know, the game ain't over till the fat lady sings. And so with a lot of our kids that are out there goofing around, uh, you know, the game's not over. Keep praying, you know, keep seeking after the Lord. But then the kicker here at the very end, in verse 7, that your prayers may not be hindered. You know, that's, uh, you know, Peter goes on. I mean, we'll get there next week. He goes on to describe how God hears the prayers of the righteous. But here he's saying that if we're not treating our wives rightly or correctly in a certain sense, that will hinder our prayers. And when, it, when I read that it will hinder our prayers, I kind of read into that that it will hinder my relationship with God. And I don't want anything uh, to do that. I mean, I want to be obedient to God and, and, and do his will just because I want to please him. But when you add in, you know, this kind of little, little barb on the end there, you know, if you, if you don't do this right, it will hinder your prayers. It will hinder your relationship with him. And, uh, <clears throat> and we don't want anything negative to impact our faith walk, you know, with our Lord. And so we want to be really careful. And, I, and I've, I've admonished guys. I said, you know, it doesn't seem like you're walking all that tight with the Lord, but it, it can get worse, you know. And so... Um, I know that when I, when I seek by the grace of God uh, to live a life that's pleasing to my Lord, it will minister to my wife. And I, I, and I know as I seek to walk in the ways of the Lord and to please him, and, and if by the grace of God that actually happens, it will minister to my wife, it will minister to my kids, it will minister to my grandkids. And there will be that kind of a, a spiritual legacy. And... I want, I want it all. I want all God's blessings. I want his favor. Uh, I want to walk in his ways as much as I can just to please him. And our marriages are just one facet of that life walking with him. And so we don't want to do anything to mess it up. Husbands, likewise, dwell with your wives with understanding, giving honor to your wives as to the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life that your prayers may not be hindered. As I uh, finish up this one little section, um, I just want to make a couple of uh, quick comments. I, uh, I read these questions somewhere else and I, I kind of incorporated them into uh, things that, I, that we can pull out of these first seven verses, but you know, husbands and wives are intended to play complementary roles. Doesn't mean we play the same role, but somehow that the roles that we live out or complementary one to another. And I guess the question would be, are we partners or are we competitors? Because I know a lot of marriage relationships that I've seen at times, it's been competitive. You know, one trying to do something or outdo somebody else or taking on something maybe they shouldn't take on, uh, different things like that. And I think that we need to examine our own hearts, our own marriages, our own lives. And are we playing a complementary role or are we competing? Because we're not intended to be competitors. Uh, are we, number two, are we helping each other become more spiritual? Is my spouse more godly because of me or in spite of me kind of thing? You know, am I facilitating his or her spirituality? Uh, am I even aware of where they're at spiritually? That's a, you know, I ask my wife from time to time. I pray for her all the time. I, I think I know her pretty well. And I know what to pray for her for. But every now and then I'll ask her, so, you know, I, I think I know what I'm supposed to be praying for you, but is there anything that you want me to pray about? And she'll always have something that I didn't necessarily think of. And, um, and so, <clears throat> you know, having that understanding. Uh, the third question is, are we depending on the externals or the eternals? Are we focusing on the outward beauty of things or are we looking at the inward beauty of things, the artificial versus the real? Um, do we understand each other? I, I, my wife and I don't always 100% agree. But I try very hard to understand her, even if I don't necessarily agree with her. And, and likewise with her. I know she doesn't agree with me a lot of times, too. Uh, not a lot of times, but now and then. Anyway, <laughs> once in a great one, every blue moon or so. You know, and, uh, but do we... 
Do we understand each other? And then are we sensitive to each other's feelings and ideas, or do we just take each other for granted? Do we assume? And we've got to be careful not to. And, then, and I would ask this, and this is, I think, more pointed to the guys, but is God answering your prayers? I'm blessed. Um, I prayed about just a little thing uh, this last Sunday, and I saw the fruition of that prayer. It's like, boom, there it is. I prayed about something else. I prayed about a lot of things. And I can't say that God answers all my prayers. I, I wish I could. But I see God answering a lot of my prayers. Um, he's blessed me in, by his grace. But that's a question that we should ask ourselves, each other. Uh, I've talked to my sons at times. You know, it, how's it going? And, and there's times, well, one son in particular said, yeah, I'm praying, I'm praying, but I feel like I'm just talking to the ceiling. And so then we, you know, we begin to explore that and talk about it and see where it's going and stuff. But you know, there's a litmus here, you know, that your prayers be not hindered. So I think that's a good question. Is God answering your prayers? And then are we, are we enriched because of our marriage or are we robbing each other in our marriage? And so, you know, do we see God's blessing? I guess be another way to put that. And these are fair questions to ask. And, you know, like a lot of other things, it's, it's, it's a time of uh, uh, self-examination, you know, Search me, O God, and try me and see if there's any wicked way in me and, you know, lead me in the way everlasting. And so it's the idea of kind of looking at those things pretty hard. But anyway, I, I really appreciate uh, Peter's uh, teaching and sermon, if you will, on, on marriage. Obviously, it didn't just apply to women about submission, but it's about a lot more than that. And, uh, and we all need to have those submissive hearts, you know, submissive spirit uh, being yielded to and submitted to our Lord. And... Uh, that's where it starts. And uh, by the grace of God, that's where it's going to end when we see his face one day face to face. What a glorious day that's going to be. Gracious Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you for the instruction that you give us that's so practical. And help us, Lord, in any way that we can. For, for those that are married to apply the, these things to their lives and for those that aren't married, Lord, to look how they can apply different parts of it to their lives and, and just to be pleasing to you. Guide us, Lord, in your ways and be glorified in your servants. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you're able, let's uh, stand together and we'll sing uh, the benediction. The Lord bless thee. The Lord bless thee. And keep thee. And keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee. And be gracious unto thee, and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up, the Lord lift up his, countenance his countenance upon thee, and give thee peace. Well, God bless you guys. I pray the Lord continues to bless you and speak to your heart and, and draw you to himself. I pray that, uh, that you just know how much he loves you because he loves you so much. You are his, his very favorite person, all of you. <laughs> God bless you guys. Have a good night. If you need prayer for any reason, come on up. We'd love to pray with you.